It is over. The NFL regular season is over. We have a million things that we want to get to. And today's episode of the Ryan Rosillo Podcast on The Ringer with Chris Long on the Podcast Network here from Ringer is brought to you by State Farm. Just like basketball, the game of life is unpredictable. Tell these two dudes about it. Talk to a State Farm agent and get a teammate who can help you navigate the unexpected, like when every aggregator NBA website automatically says you said that Russell Westbrook is available in trade. So that was fun. Um, I think I have a segment that I'm going to do on that this week and how that works. And an NBA GM that reached out to me after that was like, my God. And uh, I think it's going to end up being one of the most listened to podcasts I've ever done, which is embarrassing that that's the way it worked. And that's not the reason I did it. Uh, but how anyway. many people listen to how many people listen to the most like you've ever been listened to? How many people? I don't know, because numbers, uh, I would tell you that most numbers, like if I meet somebody and they're like, hey, I have a half a million listeners, I'm like, no, you don't. But I don't say that to them. There's a handful of podcasts <laughs> that I believe have major, major numbers. And right. then there's a bunch of people that I think lie about it. Right. So right. Um, Obama listens to this podcast. Shout out. Does he? Yeah. Well, I, I, How I do you know that? I have a guy on the inside of one of his production things, and somebody sent me a note saying he mentioned your podcast by name, you by name. Well, that's pretty cool. I mean, you think it's you? you I'm think not it's saying because... that politically. I'm just saying it's it's cool to to hear that people <laughs> who are that famous are listening to the podcast. Yeah. So I might put that. We're we're trying to get something going there where we change the logo. Yeah. Of everything, but then again, yeah. in this climate, you know, if you if it sounds like you're if you're siding with one side, you know what I mean? Who knows? Then it's just Listen, dangerous. I like I like the guy, but it's not even about that. It's just that uh, he just likes just hoops, that It's pretty cool. Yeah, he likes yeah, hoops. he likes hoops. So there you go. He's probably like, get this Chris Long guy off the air. All he talks about is football. I don't know. Some would argue that you guys would be aligned. <laughs> Some <laughs> would argue. <laughs> That's Some one of my argue. new. One of my new favorite things is because my friend called me on it. We were talking about some sort of thing where I was like, some could argue that it was this. He's like, what do you mean some could argue? That's 100% <laughs> what happened. So now we do it with anything that's blatantly obvious. Like some could argue the Pats should have won that game against Miami at home. to cinch Some up could a- argue that they didn't plan on playing in the wild card round. <laughs> Use it. Kick it around. Workshop it this week. Let okay, I'll, I'll workshop it. I've got enough bad uh bad fillers and sayings like people are on me about i say at the end of the day a lot i say this that and the third like what am i a 60 year old man get a teammate who can help you navigate the unexpected talk to a state farm agent today don't worry about that i remember one of the first tv hits i did at espn i was doing one of those 2 a.m nba shifts and you know stuff i was dying to be on it because i want to do some tv for the nba and uh I got a text from somebody that was like really good, concise, but whatever happened, like you crutched it hard. You said, yeah, at the beginning of every single sentence. And uh, I went, no way. And they go, yeah, go back and look at it. So I, I recorded people it. People have fillers, man. It's all good you have to, to do, know your fillers. All you have to do when you have a crutch and you start doing it, just I would write it out in big capital letters and I would visualize, I would look at it, the phrase and I would cross yeah. it off. And it always worked for me. So well, okay, so here's the deal. You call me out when I call, when I say dude on this pod. Do I? Don't let me say dude. No, when I say dude, just call me out from now on out. Like, I don't know if this is the last pod. We we go through the playoffs. What are we doing? I thought we were going through the playoffs, but we haven't talked about it yet. I think we? we are. We really haven't <laughs> talked about it. We're flying by the seat of our pants here. By the way, I'm, I am hungover. Um, you are hungover. This is, not, this is not a normal occurrence. We talked on the uh, FaceTime machine. Late last night, I, I'm you know I'm in Miami for the Orange Bowl, and I got to go to Prime One Twelve, one of my favorite places in the world. And Miles, who is an Eagles fan, was really riding high after that win, and uh, got to enjoy. So shout out to Miles. And then you know I told you on the phone who was there. Yeah, Miles is is the guy at Prime One Twelve, and you know look, he's just the guy. It's a scene, and anytime yeah. anybody can go to Miami for something, and you can find a way to get a table in there, it's it's that much fun. It's just, it's the food is remarkable. And the scene outside is hilarious too, because people know like who's around. So, you know, the old paparazzo, that's my, that's my, yeah, the paparazzo, (laughs) (laughs) uh, miles does a good job of kind of, you know, treating people normal and not overdoing the celebrity aspect. 
you know, not that I'm a celebrity, but I've seen celebrities in there. Yeah. And one last night is evidently a fixture is Michael Bay. Yes. Just rolls up to the bar. I'm shutting down the bar with Miles and he's like, oh, you want to meet Michael Bay? I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll meet Michael Bay. So what did you and Michael Bay talk about? We talked about a lot of stuff. We talked about like movies and stuff. I, I don't want to get too like, I don't like talking out of school about what, you know, the, the content uh, conversation, not that it was an, an in-depth conversation, but he was super down to earth and normal. And here's somebody who I hadn't read up on like his life's work. So I wasn't like starstruck, but I know how iconic he is in making these blockbuster movies. So, I mean, and then when you go back and search the movies, he, he was involved with, there's a lot more than you even think. So what? he was Give down to some. earth, man. Give us some, give uh, us some Michael Bay well, surprise. So a surprise for me was the purge. Um, I didn't know he was involved with the purge. Did you know that he got his start? Um, no, he got his start with George George Lucas at fifteen doing Raiders of the Lost Ark, and like he thought it was going to be bad. This is what I read, <laughs> and uh, yeah. And then when he saw it in theaters, he was like, "Oh my god, this is this is pretty cool. I need to do this." He did Pearl Harbor, you know, obviously Transformers, but The Rock, man, I forgot about you know him with The Rock. I didn't even realize that he was involved in that movie. Oh, so. that reeks of Michael Bay, really. Well, I mean, uh, you know, Green Smoke, man. That was that was one of my childhood favorites. Uh, I could see, you know, I could Sean, see you being Sean Connery's Bay. advice to Nicolas Cage. You know, what winners, that? what do winner, winners? Uh, it's it's vulgar. We can't say that that line. But anybody who knows The Rock knows what winners do and what losers do, and that that was uh, Sean Connery's line to uh, Nick Cage. It involves the prom queen, if you remember. You know what that says to me? That says to me, Michael Bay, the next chalk media guest. I think he might be. I think we got to get him on the fishbowl or what. Hey, we're starting to get some views, man. I don't know if we hit the algorithm or, or some shit like that, but uh, but people are starting to watch our stuff, and I'm not feeling like such a dork recording into just cyberspace um, on YouTube. But uh, it's it's exciting, uh, and yeah, Michael Bay, book him, book him. I he, he's a friend of the program. Um, right. Yeah, he did, he did quiet. He, he did quiet place though. Ryan, did you see quiet place? Yeah, I think I did. I think I did. I think that was an airplane. Yeah, I got to see that. Not a movie um, about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was cool. I also got got hammered like kind of solo at a sports bar um, with grainy TVs. You know, it's a good sports bar when the TVs aren't great and they're not big. It's called Blondie's um, in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, I'm getting a head nod from my man, Chris, here, who set me up with this on the road kit here in uh, in Miami. But I had a good time there. I, I got to watch fans at a sports bar on a Sunday for the first time, like really drinking and yelling at their team you know i had steelers fans around me that whole night the whole nine yards nobody knew who i was which doesn't surprise me but it was nice yeah that's i mean this is a guy that's working a little part-time at pep boys and he's he's just super into football <laughs> i have it i'm still still kind of big uh you know i had a guy ask me what did you used to play football but that was about the extent of it but i really enjoyed being i did the solo Rosillo thing i was at the sports bar alone and really enjoyed it Yes, it's it's the best. That was great when you tweeted that out. Um, I don't remember tweeting it out. You don't. Wow. So it was a pretty it was a pretty intense day. And the best part is that you could just tell your wife that this is all research for work. So you can't really. Well, get she, in trouble. she stopped. She stopped by Blondie's for a little bit. You know, you know, Meg likes to mix it up in the dive bar scene. So she came by for a little bit and, and then uh, left me for the second half of uh, the late games. And that's when things get weird. There you go. Okay, so here we go. We're going to run through it all. We have a million things that we want to get to here. For the 30th consecutive season, four or more teams make the playoffs. They did not make it the previous year. We have the Titans, your Titans, the Bills, the Niners, the one-seed Niners, the Packers almost one-seed Green Bay Packers, and the Vikings in after what was a major disappointment last year from a very talented roster. San Francisco on a Dre Greenlaw tackle at the one-inch line basically gives San Francisco the one seed. They could have been the five seed traveling to Philadelphia. I do want to start there because Seattle, in classic Seattle fashion, they've now trailed, looking at this season in totality, 13 of 16 games. They've had five halftime leads total for a team that won this many games. And you're thinking, San Francisco's doing whatever they want. The Seattle offense is a mess. And then it's 26-21. Russ, Lockett, maybe the most underappreciated duo per, you know, productivity wise in the league receiver quarterback and I'm thinking you know what I trust Russ as much as any other player in this league and I wasn't going to be surprised if they pulled this thing out although it still feels like San Francisco throughout has been the better team 
I don't know if it's the right thing to say the more deserving, but there's nothing fluky about San Francisco being the one seed, whereas if Green Bay were the one seed, I would have been sitting here going, are you serious? So that one inch really changes San Francisco's path, staying at home maybe until Miami as opposed to going to the East Coast for the wild card. Yeah, that that was huge. And to your point, yeah, I, I do think they're the most deserving, uh, least fluky team in the NFC. I mean, New Orleans is trending upwards as well, but everybody else is kind of limping into the playoffs. Green Bay, I mean, Green Bay really labored to beat uh, Detroit. So, uh, I and you know how I feel about um, Green Bay. And even, you know, probably the third team that's trending up in the Eagles, and we'll get to them, they don't have the firepower anywhere near as we know it's well documented that that these two teams have in new orleans and uh and in san francisco so a huge win they hadn't won Se- seattle since 11 and uh they've won ugly like the 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 washington game nine nothing in the rain then they blew people out uh the three games they lost i think were one possession ball game so uh it's not like they don't have problems they they benched a corner last night uh opposite sherm and coverage has kind of started to affect those rushers i mean they hit Russ nine times last night in one sack. That's actually not that great because that group is just has been getting dogged up front. Yeah, the numbers, you know, I know you pointed this out in a, as a guest last year on the dual threat pod, but it's just very, I mean, this isn't hard to figure this stuff out, but sacks can be misleading, but sacks can also tell you a bit of a new story on the extremes. And they were sacking the hell out of the quarterback in the first half of the season. And those guys are not getting the same amount of pressure. They're not getting the pressure numbers are actually good for San Francisco. They blitz very infrequently. Like I was going through the pressure versus blitz stuff. Like Baltimore blitzed a ton. Pittsburgh ended up, I think, being the number one pressure team in the league. San Francisco doesn't need to blitz because of those four guys, but they are not getting the same pressure. The defense just isn't the same. And that's why this game is, I think, so interesting, frustrating, unpredictable is that teams can have like up to three or four different seasons based just on opponent injuries and all these things. So San Francisco, who I still like their personnel, it's just not the same. And a lot of that has to do with a schedule that was completely different from the first half. And I still like them better than most of these teams, especially now that they'll never have to go to New Orleans to play if that matchup happens. Exactly. Exactly. And it's hard to beat New Orleans twice, but to do it at home and, and you know, like mitigating the risk factor with Drew Brees and bad weather, Hopefully it's it's decent weather for his sake if they get up there to San Francisco, Levi Stadium. Uh, it's certainly better than going and playing like in Green Bay if it if it came to that, which which uh, which I don't know. Um, but I at the end of the day, I, and there I go with my fillers. Um, you know, the, I felt robbed last night of a beast mode go ahead touchdown, and the whole scene at the goal line, uh, the dumb stuff, the the delay of game, which was just inexplicable. I mean. You know, if there's going to be any team that shouldn't do that, it's Seattle with their history. And we were just robbed of probably the loudest scene at that stadium in the history of what, you know, what holds a ton of loud moments with Marshawn Lynch scoring that go ahead touchdown. That's that's how it would have gone down. And and they botched it. But I'm glad you you called my man out by name that made the tackle it was Greenlaw. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's that was like a Mike Jones esque. I mean, it's not the Super Bowl. Mike but Jones. That's, there, it's one tackle. It's it, like literally your season hinges on one tackle. I'm not saying things wouldn't go, you know, they can't get to the Super Bowl without home field, but that's huge. And and it's literally a game of inches. It's pretty cool. And and it was a great hit. I mean, the anticipation. The he way he read it too. Inch. Like I believed him. It was great. I, you know what I mean? Like sometimes I'll hear a guy's explanation. I'm like, is that really what happened? But the way yeah. he was like, you know what? I had this assignment, but then he goes, I watch Russ's eyes and the longer Russ goes, the more the slants there. So I just try to get out there. I mean, there's hell. There's even an argument you could say that a molecule of the football did graze the plane, but you're never going to get that thing yeah. overturned in that spot. The delay a game thing yeah. is inexcusable, which was the whole thing was kind of weird. I, I think you're almost better off the amount of time that you would save just throwing a fade when everybody's scrambling to try to figure out what the hell you're doing. What are you going to lose? Four or five seconds in that spot? Now, I understand if it's right. the difference between a planned possession versus the last possession that's a freelance. But considering that they were kind of like around the 30 second, 29 second mark, I would, I would want, especially with a guy like Russ, who I would trust so much, I would want in that spot to go, let's just get everyone to the line and then you, you figure it out and then throw it away. Like how many seconds are we really losing there by at least running something because it's chaos out there. But you know, Seattle all season long and Seahawks fans know this, like the stack teams, just like as a headline, when I go through the 12 teams that are in the playoffs, this is an incredibly deep year of playoff teams. All right. It yep. is 
Like when you look at all of them, you're like, man, that team's good. Like the Vikings are a wild card team, and Seattle won 13 games this, or excuse me, Green, Green Bay won 13 games this year, and they're not even a, a buy team. Like that's crazy. But you know, Seattle consistently gets off to these awful starts, and yet they still had a chance of this whole thing. So I'm kind of repeating myself here a little bit. I guess no, I just, yeah. And, and, I looked at all no, the teams and went, this is awesome. How deep this is. It's amazing. This is the, I mean, like it just so happens it's my first season watching football and I'm, I'm hashtag blessed to see all you this, are. you know, this parody, which how do you spell parody? A pop quiz in that, in, in, in that, um, situation, not P A R O D Y. Good. No. I screwed that up once. And I felt super dumb. As bad um, as the go girls. So, you made that viral no, last night. But yeah, go Gerds. So yeah, I was in. I I was just firing off. That's almost like a defense mechanism when I'm at an empty bar drinking. Is like I got to stare at my phone because I don't want any conversations. You know. Uh, so I used to do that for different reasons. Like if I went out and I was by myself and I knew, and I would pretend somebody called me and I'd be like, Yeah, you're like somebody cares right now. I'm texting. Yeah. Yeah. But but to finish the thought on San Francisco, it's to finish the thought on San Francisco before we move on. It's like. It's funny because the one thing that worries about worries me about them in the playoffs. I mean, like you're always going to be a bit worried about Jimmy G until he does it in the playoffs, right? I think that's normal. That's not a slight. You you do that with most quarterbacks, right? You you want to see them. We've been over this, it, yeah. But, He's had a couple yeah. of nice moments, so, but I I think if yes. you're you know, I'm not anti him. I'm anti the idea no. he's going to be in that tier one. I just don't really see it with him. Well, let's just see. Let's see it play out. There's nothing wrong. I think we have to call everything. And, like, I'm just saying let's just see him make some plays in the playoffs. And, and you know, all his throws last night weren't perfect for sure. But my worry about them is actually now being able to win one-on-ones, especially if D4 doesn't get back. Um, you know, it's it's ironic that their strength at the beginning of the year that everybody was like, this is a historically good D-line, like blah, 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 is now something that we're kind of like, okay, guys, we got to get home. Chandler Jones had four sacks last week, which some people don't even pay attention to what happens uh, with the Cardinals, and that's fine, but he's had a hell of a year and got four sacks against the Seahawks all by himself. You know, and that nine hit to one sack ratio goes to tell you that they're missing fractions of time from their from from their Russian coverage relationship right now. Wow, that's actually really good stuff there. I do believe that Fred Warner can do anything. Uh, He's un- unbelievable. What is it about? Can you give us your seasoned NFL decade plus vet thing? Like, I'll just see certain things where I'm a big movement guy, right? When I see guys move a certain way, it jumps out at me. And I also have this theory that the best quarterback, like me on the dance floor. Oh, look out! How about your boy Jernigan? How about all the Eagles? Did you miss it yeah. this week or what? I did. I, I missed it this week. There were the last two weeks I've missed it. And and you know, I was just very happy for those dudes, man. I mean, obviously you can imagine I was happy, but I, I you know, I was, I was on FaceTime with a couple of them on the bus, you know, like I was like, man, this would have been a cool game to be playing and the big <laughs> moments is just like but at the end of the day, and here I go again with the at the end of the day, just like life down. is Cross good. I, I mostly love retirement. There's just and I'm being very upfront about this. There's a couple moments that I've really missed it. Um, now, not in an unhealthy way. I think anybody that tells you they don't miss it is lying. There's been a couple moments where I'm sitting there watching big games, especially at the link, and I'm like, oh, I could go for this right now, for sure. I mean, life's good. I could go for this. You're doing great for but I can't, over today, by but the I way. But I can't. You're doing great. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank like, you. There's, there's, there's no, I forgot you were is my point. So this is a compliment. You're just, you know, well, you're younger, I, you're recovering quicker. You know, it's not as much damage. Do you want to know what breakfast was, bro? I had a huge meal at about 10 p.m. there. And then, you know, when you wake up, you know, and you're hungover and you're trying to piecemeal, like doing some things around the house together. You know, I got two kids that are on vacation with me. So uh, I had to wake up to see them. And then I want to go back to bed. So I forgot to eat breakfast so on the way over here. Turkey jerky, cashews. And uh, and some cookies. That's my breakfast. That's the last 16 hours for me. I'm sure whatever you ate last night was a good base, though. So the hangover isn't base. as bad. I can't fathom having a terrible hangover and then just a couple dudes. And your dudes are like gunners on a special team. They're, you have practice squad gunners as two sons. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, they are. Absolutely. Absolutely. You you think waylon has got superhuman abilities. I'm convinced that there's some genetic thing going on there where I don't like I'm afraid the government's going to take him to run tests. What did he do in Montana that blew you away so bad? 
He got stung by a bee and he didn't, he wasn't phased. <laughs> right on his foot. Right on, on his foot. His, he goes, oh, a bee. On his fat foot. And he, and he killed it. And the stinger was like in his foot and he was smiling. <laughs> it's the most impressive thing He's I've saw. It, like if we did decade rankings, who won the decade? Waylon did. Waylon I'm going to do him the over. Decade. I I'm, mean, LeBron to be so too. lovable with a rat tail. Um, it, rat we, we call it a mullet. I'm afraid if we cut the mullet, he'll lose his superpowers. It's well, like that's a traditional, traditional Mongolian culture is that I believe you don't cut the male's <laughs> hair until he's three. Well, that that is tradition. Uh, and we're a year late in our uh, our offshoot of Mongolian cu- culture because he's turning four soon. So I got I have to reckon with that decision. Maybe you start a new thing. Maybe yeah. maybe it starts now with Waylon. <laughs> I actually get him to, to I take him to get haircuts. I took him to get a haircut last week. You're like, yeah, the usual. So like they're like, yes, yeah, still a mullet. I'm like, yes, a mullet. Do not cut the tail. Yeah, I think that's disappointment great. from from every hairstylist. But oh, well. everybody younger right now that still has a full head of hair, do more stuff, take more chances. You know, do stuff. I would, I would, if I had a kid right now, we'd be getting his haircut every week. We'd be trying all sorts oh of different God. stuff. Feathered it, it's, Vince it's, Neal style. It, you're living, vi- you're living vicariously. It's like dressing your children. You're like, you're like, that's an outfit I can't pull off at this age, at this juncture. Waylon's gonna, Waylon's gonna wear a full camo jumpsuit in the Christmas card. You know, like just. Just certain little things. It's just fun. I mean, it's just things you can't wear uh, that you, you throw that you throw on your kids. Love it. Okay. All right. So San Francisco's your one seed and Green Bay. Now, this is a credit to Green Bay, though, because I think this is the the difference between as we get to the AFC stuff here. You know, Green Bay is struggling. Lions, backup QB, all of that stuff. Rodgers is 618, 90 yards at halftime. Green Bay's down 17-3. And you know what they did? They found a way, especially to stay alive for the chance for the number one seed. But yeah. then you look at Rodgers and go, okay, as bad as this is, he figured this thing out. Where on the other side, because I don't want to spend more time on Green Bay, congrats to them. You have New England at home. Congrats to them. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> a New England team that beat Miami 43 to nothing. The Dolphins started 0-7. The Pats were 7-0. and The Dolphins finished the season 5-4. and The Pats finished at 4-5. and Despite the running numbers that were better against Cincinnati and Buffalo, I did not leave those games figuring the Pats have straightened this thing out. They figured it out. And the best defense statistically in the NFL this season, and some of the numbers are incredibly impressive. I'm going to get to those later. The Dolphins put up a 13-play, 75-yard drive touchdown for the Dolphins to beat New England at Foxborough. And now New England, instead of getting the bye and hosting their first playoff game, will host a wild card matchup. And then now, yes, I'm I'm projecting here if they were to win, even win their wild card, they got to go up against Kansas City. So look, Green Bay figured it out. New England actually got worse as the game went along. And this offense, I, I like I'll, honestly, I think all they did was prolong me picking against them an extra week right. because it's just so right. bad to watch them on offense. Well, we're going to – I'll expedite that process. I think Tennessee is going to go there and win. I could be wrong. Um, you know, certainly I've been wrong many times this year. But you know I like the Titans, and uh, I don't think – now, I was watching at a sports bar with no sound. Were they booing yesterday in New England? No, I, I didn't have the sound going either. So I, I was just – Well, going. I mean, I, P- Patriots fans, there's probably a lot of unrest, and that's very understandable. I mean, this is unprecedented for them. I mean, it's been a decade – since they played in the wild card round and they've never won a Super Bowl playing in the wild card round. This is something that playing in New England, they put a big premium on securing that buy and home field. And neither of those boxes are checked this year. Um, and to lose to Miami week 17, it's not just a, a New England Miami thing. It's like, this is why the NFL is awesome, right? We talked briefly about college football and like how a lot of these semifinal games are like blowouts and how do they get the parody again? That the NFL has. There's just no way. That's why the NFL is king. Um, you might like college football better, but you know the Dolphins, who at one time I can remember were supposed to go in 16. And shout out to Flores, uh, Brian Flores, who was a really good coach. You have a good really Flores good story he, for us. You were, I mean, he's been no, in New I, forever. I, I, you were there with him for a year. I'll tell. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what I like about him. He's not arrogant. You know, and a lot of coaches are, and certainly guys who have come from New England can get that kind of that stigma. Um, you're not talking he, about Charlie Weiss, are you? No, I'm really just talking in general. Uh, and I don't know Charlie Weiss, but Brian is a guy who's gotten this team to obviously, obviously play hard. And, you know, to do this in, in New England, you saw him kind of with his arms raised walking on the field. I kind of got, 
I kind of got goosebumps because I was like, I know how I know how hard it is for coaches, and I know how hard it is to shed that stigma of you know New England guys leave there and they can't win. They're a certain type of guy, and he's kind of forged his own path down in, in in Miami. And there's been bumps in the road this year. He's learning, but I think he's a coach of the year candidate, and it won't happen. But I think he's a candidate. Um, what he's done is nothing short of remarkable in that game. And Fitzpatrick, man, I think relative to 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 his stardom level. Not bad or, for or a quarterback, player. by the way. Leading the team in rushing, right? Are they, I yeah, don't know I if know. They'll which, make which is just, how do you that, win, how do you win five six games? How do you win five games that way? It's it's unbelievable. And for Fitzpatrick, who who ironically has aged better than a lot of these elite Hall of Fame level quarterbacks. I mean, like better than Kingsbury. Fitzpatrick. I'm saying aged as a player. I mean, oh, like oh, right oh, now, just, you, yeah, you right, right, right now, I, you know, Fitz. No, Fitzpatrick, and he has, he he has. I mean, that that beer is going to age well, but he has he, his level of play, whatever that was, has stayed, you know, wildly inconsistent, but exciting and and productive. Ton of crossers, just crossers all day long. Uh, but this dude, relative to his stardom in the NFL, I think could have the most respect out of anybody. I mean, he's not a superstar, but you won't find a player in the league who doesn't respect the hell out of this guy. And he may not have the big MVP Super Bowl moments. But a moment like that, that was his Super Bowl. And uh, he's going to remember that the rest of his life. It was very cool. Pats, the number one defense against third down on the season, 24% conversion rate against them on the year. Okay, that was 10 percentage points better than the number two team on that stat. Just remarkable. Now, granted, turnovers, I think, covered up some of their problems. They were plus 10. Well, excuse me, they were plus 24 a couple weeks ago. 10 better. Like some of the differentials between what right. they were doing and the second best team. But these stats to look at some of the DVOA stuff and the weighted stuff, I don't even think is really caught up to it. And I don't want to get out over my skis. But there's just stuff where you look at statistically where you say, oh, is New England still really this? And I mean, and hell, they were going at Stephon Gilmore and the Devontae Parker thing, and it was working. And I, look, I'm watching the game. I'm going, this is cute. This is cute. This is cute. New England will get a stop. They'll get a stop. If you had to get one stop, all season long against the Dolphins of all teams, and they can't. And so you're picking Tennessee. I'll probably pick New England at home against Tennessee. Tennessee gets a great win against Houston, but let's not – maybe I shouldn't call it great. Tennessee needed to do what they needed to do. Houston shut it down. No Deshaun Watson. It's A.J. McCarron out there running around. But Derrick Henry is back, and that one game that they missed with him, you know, they're a completely different team. He wins the rushing title. Uh and Henry, I remember the first time I watched him at Bama, I'm going, wait a minute, who the hell's this guy? And why did his leg start at his shoulders? And like, this right. guy isn't getting all the carries. This guy's behind other people. Are you kidding me? Right. Like, I, there was a stretch there where I think I liked every Alabama backup at running back better than the guy that was actually the starter. And he was the first right. dude being on the sideline. And I, like, guys are just looking at each other being like, who's this? If you're not super into recruiting, and, you know, I'm not, I haven't been on Yeah, message who's the boards six foot ton. six, 250 pound dude with a crop top? I mean, like for you to be that big and wear a crop top, I mean, you have to just you have to be a machine, dude. And how you don't switch him, him and then well, obviously, thank <laughs> God you don't. But yeah, how, how somebody is not like, hey, man, you maybe want to make tens of millions of dollars being a pass rusher or just something else like he could probably play a few other positions, which is wild. But yeah, to you, I mean, listen, wild card. I think uh, in that round, New England's about 500 and. I would argue that this is one of the worst teams they put in the playoffs, and that it just is what it is. And again, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm not. I'm not saying the Pats are done as a as an organization or anything. But like, let's call it how it is. People get mad and indignant about the Pats playing poorly in that stadium and boo them, and then wake up the next day and they're like, "Well, don't talk bad about the Patriots." So I'm like, "You just booed yesterday. Get you lost to the Dolphins. Like, it's a bad sign. No, like, let's stop playing this game." I, I think you have to worry about them in the wild card round. I don't think it's ridiculous. This is not the same Patriots team that you could bank on with an extra week of prep and the greatest ho coach of all time. Having that time to sculpt a game plan doesn't have that now and actually gets a really tough draw in Tennessee. And another disciple. What if the Patriots lose to two Belichick disciples in the span of one week? Is it over then? When they lost to Matt Patricia, that didn't seem to add up. And that was always my argument against last year's Patriots team is that they had more bad losses in last season, 10 or plus points to teams that weren't even that good. And it was the first time it had happened since a full Brady season, I think since 2006. I go, you know, right. this is different. And then, you know, they won the Super Bowl. So 
The only yeah. thing preventing people, I'm not going to pick against New England at home, even as bad as I just think this is collectively right now. And if they do win at home, then it's going to turn back into this. I wouldn't have picked New England at home against Kansas City. I wouldn't. And I'm definitely not going to pick them against Kansas City. So that's right, just that's right. just the way I feel about it. And Kansas City, meanwhile, they get the bye. And the crazy thing <sighs> They're is rolling. It's, it's not even Mahomes. Like I watch those games and think, is Mahomes really doing all the Mahomes? I still think he's the best quarterback. Maybe the bar for him is so high that I'm not being fair. Um yeah, he didn't do himself any favors by being that, you know, superhuman early. Yeah, I think that's part of it. You just expect, okay, 400 yards every single time, and two, I can't believe he's the only guy that made that throw kind of throw. But their defense, looking at this number here, uh, okay, since week 11, this is going into the Chargers win. Since week 11, the Chiefs have allowed a league-best 9.6 points per game. If you look at the overall numbers, where they are to end the season, I think they were seventh in opponent scoring, and they were really in a group by like a half a point with every team three through seven. This Chiefs defense is as big a part of the story as what we expect out of Mahomes in this passing game. And that's, I think, the difference in why you know I can't wait. I hope we get them against Baltimore, but there's no way I'd pick the Pats on the road to do this thing again against that team. No chance, dude. I, I just want to say, and people comment, rightfully so, because lately, early in the year, it was kind of like Kansas City was idling and we didn't talk about them a lot. And then lately, they've been a machine, but they've won, you know, with relative ease in a lot of these games. So they're not like the Chicago game wasn't worth talking about. It's like, that's what I expect from a team that, that's this hot right now and is starting to peak. And this is the right time for them to get hot. There's, there's, they're literally, I mean, I know Baltimore's win streak is longer, but as far as like the way this team is feeling right now, I think they have the best defense of any good team right now. You mentioned it like nine points a game. Better than Baltimore's? 11. I do. Wow. I do. Cause I think there's some holes that I think that Baltimore's defense has a couple small issues that could rear their head in the, in the postseason. And one being, you know, your edge rush, you're being able to win one on ones when you, you can't just, you know, generate pressure. Uh, some of the guys on the edge can get a little soft in the run game. You know, the Chiefs, you know, Frank Clark went to the Pro Bowl with six sacks. I mean, a lot of people were calling Frank Clark a disappointment this year. Frank Clark is going to make his money in the playoffs. Chiefs fans are going to say, wow, I'm really happy we got this guy. And Chris Jones, again, is just a machine. Uh, it was funny as hell seeing Chris, Phillip Rivers punch him with it did you see that little baby punch he yeah threw? it was so it was so whiny it was it was so ridiculous but um it was like i want to punch know, you but i don't want to punch you so that you actually really yeah. get mad at me yeah that's like no i think that's how his kids punch him when they're frustrated and so he just you know he's just spending too much time with his kids and he took it out on chris jones i think this is spag's best job he's ever done um because the defense is in new york that he became famous for and there's a huge gap uh time-wise stops in new orleans st louis that didn't go well um between that kind of signature performance that he he had with those really good d lines and now this group this is his best job i mean people did not see this this was again this was a weakness now it's a strength and this team i think it fits them better to play complimentary football i'm watching highlights right now i got the tv on like you know there's cityscapes there's stadium scapes when you zoom in on that crowd after a big play, like after those Damian Williams runs, who, by the way, is going to be a big part of their success in the playoffs, it is, it's just a scene. You're like, that place is so live. I don't see anybody going in there, uh, you know, outside of Baltimore who's not going to have to and beating them. I just don't. Um, great for Kansas City. I'm rooting for uh, Andy and Spags. And one of the things about Spags, we always feel like, you know, certain guys, okay, if you're around long enough, you look at tendencies and you go, okay. Spags is going to bring pressure. He's going to bring pressure. I was going through that stuff at the end of the season. And Baltimore, by the way, blitzed 52% of the time in their defensive snaps. That was more than 10% than the number two team, Tampa Bay. And I kept thinking, like, where's Kansas City? Where's Kansas City? And this is part of that personnel turnover. Like, whenever everybody talked about all those guys moving on, oh, D Ford, I like D Ford. Justin Houston, like, what are you guys doing? Look at all these sacks that you have to replace. A big reason why those guys had those sacks numbers is because last season, you knew you had to throw it 40 times to even compete with Kansas City. So there were more right. sack opportunities, again, leading to the sack number being misleading at times. But Baltimore, 52% of the time blitzing, I don't know if that's going to be something you'd want to do 
Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to talk about Brady in this group right now because it just there's been no evidence since the second half of the season that I'm supposed to just think that he's going to figure this whole thing out again, even though that's exactly what happened. He went to Kansas City last year. But Baltimore doesn't get that amount of pressure. Mm. Um, they, for a team that's, that blitzes that much, they're kind of outside of the top 10 in pressure. And that'll be kind of the fascinating thing if this ends up happening with all of these seeds. And as we know, going back to the last six Super Bowls, the 12 teams that have played in the last six Super Bowls have all been by teams. I mean, that's ridiculous. Pats, Rams, both right. two seeds. Eagles, Pats, both one seeds. 2016, Pats a one seed. Atlanta, two seed. 2015, Broncos, Panthers, both one seeds. 2014, Pats, Seahawks, both one seeds. 2013, Seahawks beating up on the Broncos, both one seeds. So what New England did by not being able to get – off the field and how they changed what this means for Kansas City. And none of this changes all for Baltimore. They've been the best team in the AFC the whole season long, so the Ravens fans probably feeling like right now they're getting left out. Your game was pointless, and you still won it, and you still ran for 200 yards with all these backups in the game. But that it that last drive, it cannot be overstated enough. If we look back at what our AFC or Super Bowl matchups are, how much that changed because New England's like, hey, Kansas City, we want to make it way easier for you guys. Um, unbelievable yeah. turn of events. It was, it was, and it was all happening simultaneously. It was, it was crazy to watch. And that's why week 17 is so cool. Um, yeah. So New England, again, on the road, you know, energy, big energy in the first quarter against a, a playoff team on the road that oftentimes you get down, um, and they're not a team that's built to come back. And that's, that's the thing that I think is going to get them. Even if they play in in phase and beat Tennessee, they're going to get down at some point in the playoffs and they're not built to close gaps like that. I could see them beating Tennessee, but if they get Henry going and some of the stuff that you've pointed out, the edge running off the sides against them, mm -hmm. outside runs, looked, outside runs. You haven't liked it all year against, uh, or what new England's done against it. And then there we go. All right. Before we get to the rest of the stuff, Eagles, I went to Atlanta for the LSU game coaching stuff a couple travel tips fashion we got it all covered today on the podcast the google assistant is ready to help you get more done with just your voice in the car at home and everywhere you take your phone when you're driving and want to listen to your favorite ringer podcast hands-free just say hey google play the latest episode of the book of basketball 2.0 podcast Sure. Playing the latest episode of Book of Basketball 2.0, Kawhi Shoots Philly, 2019's most important game, a rewatchables with Ryan Rossillo and Chris Ryan. Book hey of Google, Basket pause podcast. A little help, hands-free. Just say, hey Google, to get started. Your Eagles, I, I thought they would beat Dallas because it didn't make any sense, and then I was like, you know what, they'll probably end up losing the Giants because that doesn't make any sense, although it makes sense to Eagles fans that have seen so many disappointing losses to the Giants at the very end of the year. And then it felt like everybody was picking the Giants, and this was a fight. It was a fight into the very end. Wentz was unbelievable in this game. He was unbelievable. First of all, I think he's the best at throwing to the flats, probably because he's had the most practice. <laughs> You got angle. no choice. You got no choice. <laughs> but, but there are guys that throw it a little behind, and you have to help out your guy because that the amount of ground that could be made up in the defender if you're not catching that throw out in the flat and the stride, it's it's yeah. a completely different play. If you really watch Wentz on those, and then the um, but the, remember he missed one throw against Seattle in the flat. Do you remember that though? Uh, I think you're being so many of y'all right. fell for this first take bullshit, bro. Okay, you're so mad at first of, take and Kellerman. Go, it appears. I'm not mad at Kellerman. Like a lot of people, like people like get mad. Like even Eagles fans get mad and hate Kellerman or Stephen A. I'm like, this is their job to do TV, like do TV stuff. I I don't disrespect their intelligence. I think they're tremendous you like at doing. You like Stephen A. You're always I, texting me about those guys. It takes me a lot not to like somebody. I think Stephen A. is wildly entertaining. I think it's really funny. Although yesterday in his gloating video, I don't know if that was an Airbnb or what, but I figure he has a nicer pad than that. No offense. You know, two weeks in a row now, I've been breaking down. You know, you know, the skips video post Dallas where he throws the jerseys in the trash, wondering what why the receptacle is placed there. There's no I trash think it's bag. A prop the can. Yeah, prop can, but still low microwave. Like, you know, that dude's wiry. He's probably lifting so pretty he hard. You can takes. tell he's Yeah, he stores his takes there. And he's he's you know, Skip's kind of jacked right now. Skip also can't feel very good unless he's on some great subs. So bending down to get the the hot pockets out of that microwave has got to be a little bit of a chore. I mean, a lot, he's of, lot of guys are ripped 60s. in the one sixties, one seventies. It's not a big deal. Okay, yeah, no, okay, yeah, yeah. And 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 then and then this week with Stephen A, he's 
he does a fake swig of wine. The wine doesn't touch his lips. It's so funny. I'm like, why even pretend to take a sip? But he's got his stick. And I wonder how many takes these videos take. Like how many takes? Is it one take? Is it five? And it's so funny to me behind the scenes if he's screwing these up. Does he get frustrated? Who's filming these? Like, there's just so many things I want to know. But anyways, Max, who's just been shitting on Carson all, all year uh, because it's a big market and people are paying attention to what he's saying. If you guys fell for the okie doke, I'm sorry. Carson Wentz is not the problem. Uh, Carson Wentz is a, is a generational talent who hadn't played well at spots this year. But you know what else he's done? And a lot of people have seen this stat now. Read it and weep. He's the first quarterback to throw for 4,000 yards without a single wide receiver hitting 500 yards. And along the way this season, Warren Sharp pointed this out, but you could get it a lot of places. Along the way this season, Wentz lost his first wide receiver, second wide receiver, third wide receiver, first tight end, first running back, second running back. And literally yesterday, his leading receiver is Ward. He's throwing to Perkins. This is a dude, a tight end, who a month ago, most Eagles fans didn't know who he was. And then he throws to some dude last night, Burnett, I think his name was. And I swear to you in the bar, I go, who the fuck is that? I played on this team last year. There's no disrespect to any of these guys. Boston Scott. It's like a dream, dude. I love Boston Scott, but nobody saw him scoring three touchdowns in a pivotal game. This is all. And, and you can talk about the yards per attempt. He's got no choice. And I think the best thing that Carson did about a month ago that preceded this run was he accepted that he had to manage games. And you can still be spectacular and manage games. You can have that moment where you roll right and throw across your body and make that jaw-dropping throw at the goal line. You can have those moments, but manage the game. And that's what he's done, and he's been killing it, man. And if you look at his numbers this year, I think most people wouldn't look at that as a disappointing year at all. So the smoke's cleared. Hats off to Carson, and big shout-out to Doug Peterson. Uh, you know, three out of four years now he's delivered you know, in a lot of bad situations. I think there've been something like 90 head coaches. I saw this in, in the athletic, like 90 head coaches since 2000 that were first time coaches and only eight have made the playoffs in three of the first four years. So Doug Peterson's awesome. He's, he, I mean, he's just, this is the perfect situation. It's like the Eagles thrive in this situation. So good for them. I, I don't know. The Seattle matchup is going to be interesting, right? Who do you think wins that one? Cause the Eagles, I think, are they favored? No, Seahawks are actually a point and a half favorite on that one. Okay, so you know that makes sense. I figured it'd be close to a pick. Yeah. I thought even maybe that that the Eagles, with the way Seattle's limped into it. But here's the deal: I could we could spend all day gloating about what's just happened, but I honestly don't think this team is satisfied with the East. And as heroic as this whole sequence was for them, and you know this team's going to be loved, not like the Super Bowl team, but you know whatever happens, people are going to love and respect the the guys on this team. Offensively, there were only three players that started 16 games. Kelsey, Isaac, Carson. You know, uh, I, I listed all the things that happened. We we know it well, but I think what they want to do is win a playoff game, and they really believe they will, and I think they might. Seattle, the first time they played, and this is going to be a totally different matchup, they won 17-9. to Russ overthrew Hollister in the end zone. Metcalf maybe dropped a ball for that would have been a touchdown, so it could have been a lot uglier. Um, but at the same time, Seattle ran for like 176. That's going to be different, right? Um, also, uh, you know, Clowney wasn't playing and the entire right side of the line was out and now they're out again with Brooks dislocating his shoulder and Lane having a high, high ankle. I don't know if he plays. So Clowney's going to be the big X factor that might change this game up, but there's going to be a lot that's different. The, the, the defensive backfield for the Eagles is shuffled. They did a really nice job yesterday allocating what little resources they had without Mills and Darby. Um, and yeah, so Douglas is the one to watch, you know, he got picked on a little bit yesterday, but he's a competitive kid. It's going to be a really good ball game. And the link, you can do anything at the link. You've could said get that. Deshaun you, back, too. You win a game, right. you could get Deshaun back. No, you're right. And that's, you know, you sit there. I always think it's kind of funny whenever anybody looks at the playoffs. You're like, well, nobody wants to play that team right now. And you go, well, that's because these are the 12 best teams. And usually there's not some sort of walkover opponent. It's tough when you look at the personnel that way. I think at one point, didn't Philly end up finishing with their number four and five corners? And you're going, yes. you know, what? what is happening to this team? And then... I think it was Ross Tucker. I hope I'm getting the the tweet right because he's a good dude. Tweeted out apparently the Eagles had the greatest practice squad of all time. Now it's also been pointed out like Miles Sanders gets lumped in with this. That guy was awesome, and you would know more about him if he wasn't at Penn State at the same time as, as Saquon Barkley. Um, oh, he he was terrific. So that was a great pick. That he, guy's that guy's going to be a decade plus long star in Philly. He has he is sort of you know Wentz is the 
thing put putting this all together because you know there are times where I thought the defense would figure this out and then it didn't happen. And I, I just I don't think there's anything wrong with like you're not supposed to talk about when you're hurt. Maybe Brady's hurt, right? They take the knee yeah. basically at the end of the first half. Brady's messing with his elbow. He's never going to tell you anything because you're just those are the rules. I don't, I don't think he's right. For the right. record, I agree with you. I don't think he's right. You don't think he's right? Okay, that's it. Would make sense. I mean, unless you're the guy you know who hasn't you know has a trainer spot you and then you don't do as well on the bench and you're like oh, yeah like a couple nagging shoulder things that's that's right. usually i usually do way better um <laughs> i i don't think brady would be doing that uh i don't i think there are some athletes that aren't afraid to tell but for anyone that's pro or anti wentz or philly you you have to look in the mirror at some point and say if any of these teams can kind of beat any opponent because of the way the sport works it's just to look at the guys that he's had and the options that he's had, and you're you're seeing like my thing with quarterbacks is, hey, when you know you've got to go out there and make a few plays, do you try, or do you? I don't want to say Alex Smith it, but Alex Smith it, where it's like, okay, I got the completion and I can move on. I think Kirk Cousins has a little of that in him too. Um, yeah, you know, Derek Carr definitely has that in him. Like I was looking at yeah. some of the stats because I wanted to get into this Jameis thing. But, you know, there's a time where whatever your responsibilities as a quarterback are, they change in the course of a game. And, you know, Brady's maybe the greatest ever. When Brady has to make a play, like he'll find a way to make a play to at least make it competitive on the throw. And some of these guys don't change their mindset at all even when it's some of these really important drives, and I'm not just talking about Week 17, and I think anybody that's really locked into Carson the last few weeks, even though it wasn't great a couple weeks ago, it was bad, and then Carson sucked again on all the TV shows. Like You're lying to yourself if you don't see some of the difference with him going, hey, this is what we need right now, so I'm going to have to change my aggressiveness, change my approach, and maybe make a throw that I wouldn't always make. And then, of course, we have Jameis who we have to get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, listen, Josh McCown, by the way, going to the playoffs for the first time in a 136 year career. Um, so congratulations to Josh, who's a great dude and came on in a mentorship role. Um, but Carson, I think t to your point, some quarterbacks don't know when to make the throw. And it's like a lot of other positions, you know, pass rusher. I know this. Well, some rushers who are very productive don't know the moments to make a big rush. And it's not like you just decide to, but you know where you have to use your, your ace in the hole or like a counter move that you've been saving. You know, like you play an entire game and, you know, your speed rush, speed rush, power, power, power. And I'd wait to bust out a spin at the right time. Now, sometimes it wouldn't get get home or the ball would be out quick. But the same thing with quarterbacks is like this is the time I have to do something acrobatic. I have to create something. And to, to my point earlier, Carson has decided, OK, I'm going to chill out. We're in 12 personnel. We're going to hit the tight ends a lot. Even 12 personnel with, with Ertz out and a lacerated kidney. That's another difference that's going to happen probably between the first meeting and the second meeting. But yeah, I mean, quarterbacks have to know when to make throws. And Carson's trying to starting to figure out that somebody with that much elite talent, you don't just use it every play because you have it. You save it up. You check things down when they're there. And then you make big plays when you have to. Let's get to some of the coaches. Jameis as well. And then uh, little tales from Atlanta. Before we get to that, though, I want to remind you, DraftKings is one of our sponsors and because the regular season is over your fantasy season doesn't have to be with the start of the playoffs this weekend you can still get your fantasy fix with DraftKings, the leader in one day fantasy and if you've never played before there's even more good news new users can play for one million dollar top prize this weekend here's what you do you draft your lineup and feel the sweat like never before, every run, throw, and catch mean more with a DraftKings lineup on the line. It's simple. Just draft your lineup, stay under the salary cap, and see how your team stacks up against competition. Nothing adds to the sweat of watching the game, quite like having a shot at the $1 million top prize. And be sure to check out the newest game mode, Flash Draft. Now you can draft a new team for a single quarter of a live football game. Download the DraftKings app now. Use the code Rosillo, R-U-S-S-I-L-L-O. New users enter that code Rosillo at sign up and play for your shot at the $1 million top prize. That's code Rosillo for your shot and a chance to play for $1 million. That's the top prize only at DraftKings. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. I would imagine if I were stationed on kind of one of the poles, Arctic regions, yeah, I would play a lot of fantasy football. Like if you're you listening to, right you, now, you're, you're checking out plate shifting and, and some core temp studies, and you're just in one of those trailers where... Yeah, you're just straddling a tectonic plate in, a, uh, in like a shitty airstream. Yeah, you're reading your stuff, carbon data. 
uh, carbon aging, all sorts of those things, all those categories. Climate change, climate change, not right. to be political. No, but I read uh, in the Rockefeller book, I was reading about a, a thing the other day about climate change where there was like, hey, we're using a lot of coal here. We went from not using coal to using a lot of coal. And it's to 1910, warming warming the Earth's temperature because of a hazy cloud. Just a coincidence, stuff. though. Um, yeah. Shout out to Bo Coaster, who asked for that topic in our little grab bag of topics. My oh, Jack, are you going to start start rapid firing some AMA tweets? No, but but I was like, you know, I was I was I was sipping last night and I was like, man, you know what? I'm feeling a little bit burnt out right now. I've been watching games all day drinking. I need a little help from the fans from Twitter.com. And we had a lot of good, good uh, suggestions and climate change was one. So I'm glad you had some historical context. There you go. Yeah. So I just whenever I think about those guys stationed there, it's like, hey, what do you want to do with your career? I'm like, I'd like to go somewhere where there's no other people. And I'd like to sit in a trailer and just check readouts the whole time yeah i mean first yeah. you'd have to start smoking you'd have to learn to smoke immediately and then have to have an xbox what do you mean learn to smoke how do you, how do you learn to smoke <laughs> well you would just show like up and be so... like hey i don't smoke and you'd be like well now you do because you're in the arctic and i would have oh, to think you, that the, oh. the dating like there aren't a lot of options so I, i'd imagine dating, you just, there's no human beings do you yeah, see any I, of these movies can you imagine like being five dudes assigned to a trailer and then, like, some genealogist shows up. I should say geologist. I feel like I added an extra syllable in there. Um, totally different. I don't know why a genealogist would be in the Arctic. Maybe bones. Yeah. Well, and you're trying to get some wool woolly mammoth samples. Uh, woolly mammoth and also imagine, could be brought back. Yeah, coming Just, back. I'm yep. I'm all for that. A lot of people are anti. I'm all for it. Um, well, imagine getting too high in the Arctic in your little trailer and having a panic attack. Uh, you just go Arctic. outside. I, mean, I don't think you. I, no, I think you'd be all right. No, you go outside and you freeze to death, and you, you stare out there over the 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 massive expanse of just emptiness, and you're like, I'm nowhere near an, an amenity. I need like an Xbox and a TV. I need like something to to chill me out. Yeah, that would be a bad place to have a bad high or a bad trip for that matter. For those of you who are inclined, I always thought that a good stand up. I'm always thinking of bad stand up content, but I thought I came across some good stuff when Lost was really peaking and just, you know, the guy would talk about storylines and he would say, you know, imagine dating on the show Lost <laughs> and it wouldn't be like, because I, I might not get it because I never watched it. It was good. You would like it. Uh, it was actually really good. It was a really, really uh, good show. I know some people had a hard time with the ending. Most endings. Can you explain it to me in 15 or 30 seconds? Like what's your elevator pitch for this show? That I can't. Completely Spoiler alert. Disorienting. It's just oh. an island and a bunch of stuff keeps happening that doesn't make any sense. And you want it all to be tied together. And it continues to make less and less sense. And then there's oh. one season in there that really doesn't make any sense. Are you and talking about Gilligan's Island? It's kind of just a newer. It's a millennial Gilligan's Island. Uh, I shouldn't even say because I don't think it's assigned any any age group. No, at there's, all. it's it's not a millennial thing because this is like way back in the day, bro. So like you uh, should get into it. I, don't, I actually think you would like what, it what's, way what's more. What's the deal with spoilers? Like wh it's been over a decade. People that complain about spoilers online, even five days after a show can kick rocks like, dude, spoilers get offline. Can I talk freely about art? Art has happened. It passed you by. I don't know if I call lost art. Can I talk freely about art is the best quote we've had in the 17 podcast. All season, huh? All season. That was that was incredible. Uh it's been a shitty year. Speaking of I, I, I just got I got derailed there, but yeah, I'm not even gonna do the lost. You got lost. Yeah, I'm not gonna do the lost stand up thing because now it's just we're too down the tracks. It wasn't that great anyway. And I think I've said it before on the radio show. Jameis Winston, not great content, 30 for 30 <laughs> jokes. Everybody made it. But 30 picks, impossible that he would start his career with a pick six, impossible that he would end the season when everybody wanted him, like everyone's rooting, going, give me 30, give me 30. Okay, pick six, lost the game, 30 picks. And then he said afterwards, like, hey, all I have to do is clean that up, and I'm balling. Um, just clean it up a little bit. Just clean it up a little bit. I don't, I don't blame him. Here's, here's my Jameis comp. Jameis Winston is the guy who's older. He's got a lot of different ri like wrists bracelets going on he's got a big maybe even a brightling an old super avenger he's got courtside yep. seats the miami heat every time mm -hmm. he gets the robert graham promo email he's like banging it 20 percent off 
I want a martini glass all over my dress shirt. I want to roll the cuffs so you see the floral arrangement. Robert Graham. And he's sitting there front row. And the girl he's with, despite being a touch weathered, is like a great, great score for him. And you're going on the surface, like, look at look at that. Like, he must be doing something right. Because on the surface, like, look at some of Jameis's numbers. They're, they're incredible. But then you're like, is he... Like, do we know the full story? Do we know all the cocktail waitress that he talked to? Do we know about all the dating sites that he wasted money on? Do we know about the boats that he's bought and invited out like 10 the girls? The credit cards that, that he signs right. up for at, like, at, at Dillard's. Like, do you want a credit card? Yeah, I'll take a credit card with my four Robert Graham shirts, which, by the way, I needed an outfit for tonight, the Orange Bowl, and I, I glanced at a Robert Graham shirt, not for the Orange Bowl, but I was like, what the fuck are these shirts? Uh, I, got I don't know if you. this is cool I got or not. one for you cool? that's, that's so unbelievably terrible um i may send it to you because i think it'll fit you because that's what it was like I will. yeah i mean i'm gonna bring it to new orleans so you're gonna wear Does robert graham have models not that i'm a model I'm, just, I'm a seven and a half we've been over this but uh you know maybe robert graham needs uh you know come get me but robert my point graham, come get me my point is <laughs> Is that you're looking at it and he's he's probably just a guy because I always feel bad for the guy that has like ten girls on the boat and you're like, Man, that guy's crushing it. And you're like, Yeah, they're just they're just drinking all is of this he... rose and they get it to be on a boat and they're like, This is just And an then Instagram when the boat shoot. rides over, they all go home. Yeah, they all go home and then he's sitting there being like, Look at all these pictures and he posts them and you're like, Whatever, like none of these girls like you. And I think that's kind of what Jameis is, courtside guy, Robert Graham. And the great thing is is that the girl, much like Tampa, knows this isn't a long, this isn't like a marriage deal. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? No. I. What if they whisper to him? What hey. if Bruce Arians whispers? Hey, buddy. I, I like the, I like the tweet that um, Dragonfly Jones uh, did yesterday. He said, Jameis is like the shitty dad who only sees his kids four times a year, but when he comes through, it's fucking fireworks. He's coming through with the new PlayStation <laughs> and taking the kids to Six Flags and stopping at McDonald's and Toys R Us on the way there. Again, shout out to Dragonfly Jones. Great follow. And that is just, that was so poignant. I mean, you never know what you're going to get, but when you get you get the good stuff, you really get the good stuff. And he's good for football. He's entertaining. People love talking about Jameis Winston. He's good for business. Okay, I don't know. Like business would be fine without Jameis throwing a million picks. Uh, I'm not even telling you I'm anti Jameis. I'm just anti. Like I already know what every fucking article is going to be about Jameis Winston next year. I just know. I just know what it's going to be because I've already read them before, and I think we have enough data here that tells us he's not great making decisions with the football now. Some of the crazy stuff, like I like those next gen stats on quarterbacks because it kind of tells you like where are guys living. Behind Stafford, Winston is the second most aggressive, not on contested throws, but on the kind of average air yard to stick. So how often are you throwing it in the combination of all of your throws? Like how many times are you throwing it beyond the sticks? And Stafford is one by a pretty wide margin. And Jameis is number two by like a wide margin. And then it's just a collection of all these dudes. And Jameis is consistently like one of these guys that's always pushing the ball down the field, which is something I think we like because there's a lot of just sort of, I think, fraudulent QBs who live behind the sticks on average all the time. And then we look at completion percentage. We look at some of these yards and you go, okay, yeah, but on third and eight in, in the red zone down four, like, what are you doing? Because you got to push it you got to get that ball into the end zone to let the guy make a play. And Winston has done that. The problem is the other team catches it. So, um, yeah, they, they do tend to, they do tend to catch it. Um, you know, Jerry from uh, Entourage was also in our mailbag. That's another nice little name drop. I wouldn't call it a mailbag because that's an exclusive idea from my Green Light podcast. Nobody's ever done a mailbag until we did it. Um, yeah, it was I, a good I won't invention. call it a mailbag. Yeah, yeah, it's a great invention. But Jerry said, um, you know, if there's a what's he likened he likened him to a boxer, and I would say if he said it was a boxer who had like great power punches, dynamic stuff, and then like a weak chin, I think is what he said. I said, so, I mean, he's kind of like Roy Jones, right? I mean, like just tantalizingly skilled. And you know, I'm no boxing head. Maybe we can get Max Kellerman. On yeah, because you just screwed up. Because Roy Jones, prime Roy Jones, was incredible and worked. He everybody. was, but 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 if he had, yeah, but if he had one, if he had one uh, one Achilles heel, it was the it was the chin, right? At the end. I mean, and then once you're a okay. boxer and you can't like well, boxing is unbelievable because there's no faking it. Like once you're done and you don't like getting hit anymore, it's over like that. 
It's kind of like right, running right. backs. Like I'll never forget Ricky Williams when it was over. It felt like, hey, look at this guy. He's awesome. And then next week you go, how come he's falling down all the time? And it was because right. he was just a completely different guy to tackle once his body shut down. So Roy Jones didn't have a weak chin. I'm not saying I'm not saying that like a well, it wasn't weak I, enough. I, I hate saying you know, we're gonna have it's to go stronger than this. my chin. I mean, this dude's a badass, but yeah. Um, let me let me go here because I just don't think it mattered because he he wasn't getting hit. Um, yeah, he was doing that cool thing in Fight Night where he just roll back and forth. Do you ever play Fight Night all the time? I used to crush people with Jake Lamada, raging. Bull. I love I love Fight Night. My big thing though is I started creating guys in the UFC thing, and I would just make them monsters, and then I would try <laughs> to kick another guy's leg as many times as I could. I'd only go like outside <laughs> kicks to the lower leg. I wasn't allowed to throw any punches, no grappling, no takedowns, nothing, and I would just absolutely be howling by myself. Like in the middle of the night get, in my uh, basement, get, being like, I, I hit it. this guy 700 times. In a and like the great thing is in the UFC video game, if you'd hit a guy's leg that many times, like he wouldn't be able to walk a little bit. And then if you just tapped <laughs> so it, like kind of glitch off. Yeah, he would glitch off, but it made sense because all I was doing was working his leg. <laughs> and only one like leg. Hover, the guy's like bopping and hovering out of the ring, like all glitchy. You're you're in your basement. I totally have this. Just alone with the lights off. Not to like disparage, you know, we've talked about this. I respect your 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 lone wolf status, but you know, I can totally see you being the guy that makes all your creative players look exactly like you. And if you make a creative player, yeah, I guess is is that your style, Rye? Do I have you pegged correctly? Uh yeah, and the UFC stuff I would. It would always be just a monster, almost like a Bane type character, Tom Hardy if Tom Hardy worked With out. With your face. And then yeah, and then I would always do something weird like a Brazilian tattoo, like the Brazilian <laughs> yeah, flag yeah. on your chest. Uh cuz I used to think oh, it be would, like yeah, if you were good. shot, if somebody like a friend of yours there was a shooting attempt on him, I would think a badass tattoo would be a bullseye with bullet holes around the bullseye <laughs> to be like, you're already just, thought about this. yeah, like the Teflon. Because if you ever got into a fight with a guy that had a bullseye on his chest with bullet holes that missed the chest, you'd be like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to yeah. take a pass on this one. I'm not going to fight this guy. Shoot. Even like at, from a very young age as children, we were conditioned to know that you don't fuck with Brazilian dudes, man. Like, you know, uh, Blanca from uh, Street Fighter. And then, like any any UFC guy with like br the Brazil flag next to their yeah um, pass to yeah, I'm just like I'm not. I don't want to fight you. I'm good. Like you know stuff. You know Brazilian stuff. Yeah, that tattoo goes a long way. That's unbelievable, though, that we learned that this American culture. There's just white guys everywhere knowing not to mess with Brazilian people because of the street. Just don't mess game. with Brazilian dudes. They know Brazilian stuff. By the way, Roy Big Jones uh, got disqualified against Montel Griffin in '97. And then, honestly, should have been fifty and zero. And then he lost to Antonio Tarver seven years later. Um, really, for his first loss, he beat Tarver in a decision because I was there. And then he fought him again in Tampa. I was also there for that. That was um, unanimous decision. So he had lost to Tarver like three times. It just, I think, at that point he was how many years in? Um, I'm just arguing that I don't think Roy had a weak chin. I think the end of his no, listen, career made it look like he had a weak chin. That's all. I, I know stuff about boxing. I don't know that much. So, Max, now now you know how I feel. Hey, what's going on with Kyle? Watching Is he going to start fighting? At, what's going on with, with Kyle? Because I've seen some of the MMA training videos. He keeps doing the kind of um, eyeball thing with it. Is he going to fight? I don't think he's going to fight, but he would be really good in UFC. I'm just telling you, he, he it's 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 it, the hands are heavy. And... Listen, the fight thing, just don't post pictures of you fighting or uh, videos of you fighting because I've noticed, and I'm not saying it, there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying when you post videos of you fighting, you're going to have every dude that you could kick their ass coaching the shit out of you <laughs> in there, like in the most condescending ways. It's unbelievably like, condescending. So then like, I think everybody should just go to those guys' Instagrams in non-fighting situations and coach them up on life as if they don't know what they're doing. Like... You're like, yeah, you could probably be a better dad here. Uh, you know, that your, would be great. Kids, you, yeah. yeah. Like, I, I don't mean, eh, I don't love, I don't like, like what's going on there. You get a lot of fruit, lo fruit you know, hey, on. as a husband, <laughs> fruit roll ups. Yeah. As a husband, you know, I think there's better anniversary spots to go to dinner. Like, I'm just saying, like, but keep it up. Keep she working. could do better. Hey, guys, great yeah. pick. Did you settle too young? <laughs> be honest. Exactly. Do you drive around your small town at 35 going, should have. <laughs> 
I should have not married my high school. Uh, man, hey, listen. Hey, listen. Boxing's hard. And boxing is... People that know boxing, I have no interest in trying to chop it up with them and prove that I know boxing. That there was, was just guy, something that I heard. Re- unrelated to all that, there was a guy that was really giving it, giving me the what for recently. And it was um, somebody in the business. So I was kind of like, all right, you can relax. I almost followed his wife just to piss him off. Yeah. What? Yeah. I thought about it. I was like, I'm just going to randomly follow the wife. Like, hey, great content. How, this must have been a bad r- what for, because usually you take the high road. I felt like that was the best passive aggressive kind of high road thing where I was like, you know what? I'm just going to follow his wife. And then she'll probably follow oh me because she sees dude. the blue check and being like, oh, somebody in the business followed me. And uh, I wasn't like going to do anything other than that. I just wanted no, him I, to know. <laughs> like, I hope not. Wait hey, a minute. Hey, this listen, guy that I just called cuck, out cuck, randomly cuck followed and my Ryan. wife. <laughs> cuck and Ryan. That's your new name. Cuck and Ryan. Every time you go on TV, and no, talk that's NBA. not. That's not, no, like that's never been. That's never will. Never been my thing. But I just wanted to be in his head a little where he went. Wait, what? Like he just. I guess who followed me the other day? Yeah, that's what? that's a, that's that's an intimidating thing because it's like I'm bringing the 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 drama to your front door, proverbial, yeah. proverbially speaking. You get a one way ticket to your dome. Okay. <laughs> let's talk so uh, scary oh god ryan russillo followed my wife what's gonna yeah, happen right i mean honestly i hope she she's not i hope cared. i hope she's not shooting hoops in a manhattan beach public park at some point yeah and just so we have this on the record i i didn't expect that it was going to be like a thing like hey guess what guess how excited i know i could sort of phrase it that way chances are like but you do notice it like you notice it in the game of how this stuff works when somebody verified follows you no matter what like you see it on the no. verified feed, you know, which is what I look yeah, at more. Yeah, for sure. Verified flex. There you go. There you go. You're like, wait a minute. That's weird. Like, now he's super into decorating. Oh, oh, yeah, he's yeah. that really talented NBA analyst uh, who's terrific on the radio and uh, is also a cuck on the side. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's do, uh, let's do a little coaching stuff. Because wait, no, guys you're not go- the cuck. You're, you're yeah. not the cuck. Right? No, no, I know I'm okay, not. Sorry. So I, that's fine. No one would say, hey, you know what I'm super into is having everybody's wives. But I just I know that that's not what I'm like. No one would ever admit that. <laughs> no, that's, but I, that's why it's funny. Right, right. <laughs> it makes no sense. So let's get to some of the coaching stuff that we know. Kitchens is out. Kitchens recently this past week described to me as this. You would absolutely love him. Love him. Guy's guy. You would love this dude. Can't believe he was ever a head coach. So he's out in Cleveland. Um, you know, some of the stuff that was coming out from Cleveland was really, I thought the Florio stuff was pretty interesting, but it seemed pretty obvious that the sourcing there was from ownership because a lot of it became like not only kitchens, although like, Hey, what is Cleveland doing week 17 against Cincy? And we'll make our decision on that. I don't know. That sounds like a throwaway line. I I don't know why any result against Cincinnati would mean anything. looks like Dorsey's going to stay, even though there are rumblings that maybe he gets demoted, you know, so he's out. Shermer's out with the Giants. Sounds like by the time this comes out, Ron Rivera could have a job with the Redskins. What's going on with Matt Rule and Baylor? Do you have, before we get to anything that you'd want to do specifically on the coaches, you played for Peterson, Belichick, and then Fisher, who coached forever and apparently was like impossible to fire. They even gave him a bonus when they moved. But do you have Week 17 stories maybe around St. Louis and your time there where it was like uneasy and everybody's anticipating Black Monday? Well, I got so good at like dealing with change in st louis i think i played for like five head coaches um maybe not maybe it was four i don't know but that it was too many too many head coaches for my liking in a young career um and one time after week 17 i'm not going to name the coach it was like a position coach or a coordinator you know you're walking out of the building and i'll tell you a little bit about what the psychology of week 17 is like for an nfl player but you're walking out it's kind of like the last day of school you know, you feel like you're disappointed because you sucked, but also it's a lift because you don't have to suck anymore. There's nothing worse than uncontrollably just sucking at football late in the season as a team. So when it's over, it is kind of like the first day of summer, but it's weird. It's dead of winter and you're excited to go to the beach or whatever it is. Um, and I'm walking out and I, I see a coach in the hall and I'm like, hey, it's been a pleasure working with you. <laughs> and He's like, uh, I'm, I'll be back next year, Chris. And I was like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I did that twice. Oh um, my god! You know, I sometimes say the awkward. End, the I say yeah. I sometimes say the awkward thing in general, like something just you know when you say something that just comes out wrong. If you're socially a little bit anxious or awkward, I don't think I'm socially awkward, but 
sometimes I just forget the right thing to say that normal people would say. And for me, that's what my computer brain spit out was it's been a pleasure working with you it's kind of like when the flight you know the the person at the desk says have have a nice flight and you say have a nice flight back that and 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 that was super awkward but i had a lot of co- i seen a lot of coaches fired i've been on a lot of teams that we knew we were in the playoffs for quite a long time and ironically we talk about seattle we'd always play seattle week 17 i think i played week 17 seattle five times which is a a motherfucker um but in general, like the last week of the season is super weird because you want to play well. You always play hard as an NFL player. Like you're always auditioning, but at the same time, you don't want to get hurt. Not in the second half because the worst thing you do is go under the knife like two, three days later and spend your entire off season after that terrible season rehabbing. And that happened to me one year uh, up in Seattle. I was trying to arm tackle Lynch because I couldn't get off a block um, and I kind of just you know, whip my hand out there to try to cut him down. And obviously Marshawn Lynch has made a concrete. So my hand just exploded and I had to have a plate put in there. surgery. This is in the fourth quarter. This is one of the last plays of the game. Ugh. And, you know, had I been out of that game, I wouldn't have had probably two hand surgeries now. Uh, you yeah, know, I spent like six months rehabbing that thing. That's the worst possible scenario in a week 17. Also like exit meetings are super awkward. You know about exit meetings, right? I do. Yeah. I mean, but do I, you know, like how do you know, like you have to see every position co- or every coach that you dealt with. So you have to see the coordinator. You have to see your D line coach. You have to see the head coach. There's such formalities, bro. And everybody's waiting outside the door. It's like a bunch of kids waiting outside a teacher's office. And you're kind of like, why do I have to go to this meeting? They're going to probably cut me or like, you know, I'll be somewhere else next year. I'm a free agent. Like, do I really have to sit here and hear like three minutes of small talk from a coach? So week 17, the last day of school, super weird, super awkward. You also have to do, there's guys rushing out the door that don't like disclose medical stuff because they're like, yeah, you know what? My hand hurts, but I'm not going to put this on the paper. I don't need to see another doctor. I don't need to see the orthopedist for another hour. I got to get to Aruba. So that's just like week 17 in a nutshell. It's really weird. I I look at it this way. Like, you know, there's there's kind of different philosophies, right? And I remember the one philosophy that was explained to me from a college AD was like, what must be done eventually must be done immediately. And if you know you have the wrong guy, get out of there. I mean, we've had a good stretch of, I mean, I don't even say good, I shouldn't phrase it that way, uh, but we have had a healthy stretch of coaches getting canned immediately. And yeah. where you look at Atlanta, like I am not a fan of, hey, this isn't going the right way. We like our GM. We like our coach. We think our players like our coach. I like my coach. Like, I would actually hire this guy if I had an opening and he interviewed and I hired him for a reason. Even though we're not 500, I'm thinking about Dan Quinn right now in Atlanta. Like, I actually admire that where it feels like the public goes, oh, look at this. Like, you guys are just stale and you're keeping everybody around. And I'd rather an organization, again, if I trust the people making the decisions, but like Arthur Blank has tried it a bunch of different ways. He's done a bunch of different things, and he's just like, look, I, I trust Dan Quinn, and I, I trust Tom in the front office, and that's that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to just fire these guys because I'm supposed to fire them and appease everybody, and I think some organizations can't help themselves. The Giants certainly do that, and we're going to see some of these offensive guys flame out quickly uh, because you know McAdoo was hired for Eli, and then that went completely the other direction. And then Shermer was supposed to be there for a new quarterback, and then that's not going to work. And then you have Kitchens, who it's like the only reason he got the gig is because they thought it was some consistency with Baker, when really Baker beat a bunch of bad teams at the end of last year, and that's what got Freddie a head coaching job. So I'm rarely going to say, I look at this team and this guy absolutely needs to be fired, or I'll say they absolutely can't fire him. But I just think that that patience from ownership to the front office and all that stuff should be more... I don't know if celebrated is the right word, but it should be more accepted. No doubt about it. It should be more accepted when an organization just goes, hey, you know what? We actually like our guys. Sorry we went seven and nine. Yeah, I I think sometimes we try to just blow stuff up when we don't have a – and that's the thing about coaching. We don't have a a solution. We just have to fire somebody. And then teams get in these big cycles of like a million coaches. I'm watching TV right now. They have the uh, Washington head coaches. There's like 56 on the screen right now. Um, And by the way – uh, you know, Allen's out, uh, which which is a big deal to wa- Washington fans. They probably went from one of the most miserable fan bases to one of the happiest uh, in, in a span of, you know, 48 hours. And by the way, also another factory of sadness in Cincinnati, 
is super excited now because they got Burrow. So changing the tide, maybe, uh, you know, Ron Rivera, uh, you're going to you're going to see some reshuffling of responsibilities in the front office in Washington. Uh, but Allen mishandled, uh, you know, the franchise thing with Kirk Cousins. They franchised him twice, let him leave in free agency, mishandled Donovan McNabb, RG3, Cousins, alienated Trent Williams. Um, and the weird thing with the Snyder dynamic is he's supposedly like kind of a lone wolf among the owners. He's like not that close to any of them in a meaningful way. And I think the problem there is you can't talk shop and compare notes on like, how do we improve the organization? Like, what are you guys doing? If you're not schmoozing with, you know, your buddies, you don't know about man management styles, trends, organizational operations. So, um, you know, again, worth noting at one time they had McVay, Shanahan, LaFleur. Uh, and, and that's no good. So Allen, that dark cloud is, is lifted the mentions under any, you know, Allen's out tweet were just gold. Um, and, and yeah, I think things are looking up. Here's a guy who I, who I would love to see hired. I, you, we, I think we both like rule, right? You like rule Matt rule. Yeah. Uh, what he's done. So, and the only reason I guess he didn't have the jets job is they told him the coordinators ahead of time. And then, I mean, I've heard him link to more than just the giants. So Listen, if if he ends up somewhere, you know, if he ends up in New York, if, if gosh, if Gase gets canned, he, he could be, I hate to see Darnold wasted. Um, who I really want to see get a job is Biennemi, uh, who among players and coaches, guys that I talked to, I reached out to a couple of people, you know, this morning to be like, hey, what's the differentiating factor for this guy? Everybody loves his X's and O's. He's very, very knowledgeable, very respected. Guys like him, but that's sometimes not enough. You know, I, every good coach I've had has one differentiating factor and for him the thing that keeps coming up is he doesn't think he's hot shit and doesn't treat anybody like hot shit and so I think he'd be perfect for Dallas I mean obviously that system Dak would thrive in um, but here's a guy who doesn't view himself as a celebrity I've heard the words used you know doesn't view himself as a celebrity he doesn't treat players like celebrities he's honest he's honest as the day is long and that's not a, a given with coaches I think I think he could be in, good in Dallas. I think he'd be good. In, I also like Harbaugh maybe in New York. Wait a minute, that's Jim? a weird one. Yeah, Jim, Eric sleeping with the enemy. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Remember that one? Yes, yes. Now, what what do you think about Harbaugh though? Do you think uh, he's going to leave Michigan at any point, or you're the college football guy out of out of the two of us? Well, I, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't go that far. Um, yeah, I like college, but I, I don't, you know, my, all my Harbaugh stuff has actually, you know, I'm usually like, Hey, this is kind of something I feel, or this is just a total guess. But me talking about Harbaugh at this point would be uh would be a guess. I just think he's a really good football coach and it hasn't worked out at Michigan to the level that you would hope it would work out at. I got one more read. Today's podcast is sponsored by ADT commercial for business. ADT commercial for business serves businesses ranging from mid size organizations to large scale enterprises. Think of them as a special team who has one focus, your business security. They provide a comprehensive line of security, fire, life, safety, and risk management solutions, professional grade systems for commercial grade businesses with ADT commercial. Every day is game day. Fortune 1000 companies rely on ADT commercial for highly complex, scalable, integrated solutions that help solve their unique unique business challenges. And if you're looking for a partner to upgrade or take over the monitoring and service of your current system, ADT Commercial can do that too. They can help to painlessly install and maintain large-scale and multi-site businesses. They make it easy to switch providers. Their onboarding is predictable, dependable, and painless. Schedule a no-obligation security review with ADT Commercial for Business. No pain. That's good in sports and good in business security. Visit ADT.com forward slash game day to learn more. That's ADT.com forward slash game day. Okay, so we have yeah, a surprise yeah. guest for us here. First ever guest on the recap, this, the week, uh, the week by week recap. So this is the whole recap, and it's not going to really be any football. Are you ready for this? I have no clue who it is. All right. So the question was this: It was posed last night on on part of the text thread, and then there was some side work done, some side threading uh, about different gear that's outdated, and could any of us, including this third person start wearing this gear. Maybe we all go to New Orleans in a couple of weeks and then bring it back. Could we revive a brand? I don't think I'll just immediately just tap out of this one because I don't think I would I don't think guys are like, hey, what's Rosillo wearing? I don't think that's gonna happen. But Big Cat from Barstool joins us now. And oh Daniel. Yes. Hey Christopher. Hey buddy. What's up? 
What's How up? about them birds? I'm I'm doing well. I'm actually calling from the Pet Boys in Brooklyn. Uh, I've had a little bit of a day. Been sitting here for two hours, and uh, I turned on the Serve Pro First Responders Bowl. With I did the alpha move and I took the remote uh, in the waiting room with like six other people there. But I'm doing well because I'm talking <laughs> to you guys. Well, I'm sure people at, at Pet Boys in, in, in Brooklyn respect uh, first responders and the troops, so that shouldn't have been a problem. Well, I think there was a, a guy sitting next to me who might have had Western Michigan, and I have Western Kentucky, so there was a little bit of attention there in the room, but uh, otherwise it went well. That's great. Well, good. That's that's really good. Is, you, is this an ad for Pet Boys? No, we don't have a read for that. That's not in my reads. I have one more with ADT commercial that I have to get to. <laughs> But we'll we'll do that later. I bet you Pet Boys uses ADD commercial though for all their commercial locations. They because, should. They you know, should. There's a lot Everybody of guys are going to start a business that are listening to this pod. Okay, so I, the reason I bring this up is that I think Big Cat. It looks like you want to get into the Porsche game, and I'm not talking about the car. I think we're talking about the gear because you've been shopping yeah. now that you kind of you were outside of the city for a little bit, checking out some strip malls. Yeah, so I was in Miami for a little bit, and I, you know, living in New York now, I don't get to go to malls. So I did the whole like, hey, let's go to a mall. I quickly learned that going to a mall with a six month old and going to a mall in general is very overrated. But I did do some looking around, and I am looking at possibly buying some poor stuff. I also, and I don't know where we want to start with this, but I took a look at some cargo pants. And oh, the no. first time this has happened in probably 15 years where I looked at it, I didn't buy them, but I said, those aren't that bad and kind of makes sense with all those pockets. So maybe not a 2020 move, but a 2021 cargo pants coming back. I mean, it's not. I mean, people, what's what's your little filler, Ryan? People are talking about it. I mean. I've heard people in some circles talking about cargo pants in 2021. People could argue that people could <laughs> people could argue that that Daniel's out in front of a trend here, and you're not just throwing shit on the wall. Listen, we used to love a good cargo pant, and now as a dad, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff you have to store. I find myself fumbling with my keys a lot, other items that I need to go about my day. It would be nice to have somewhere to deposit that, like it's 2006 again. I had yeah. I had paint splash cargo pants. I had I had Jerbodes, if you remember those. Do you remember Jerbodes? Bro, are you kidding yes. me? That little loop thing? Those were fire. I might yeah, I, I might I, I, I'm just saying, like, this is one of those situations where uh you know how we always do the hypothetical with sports, like, oh, the trade is happening. Who hangs up first? Let's just say I was on the line with cargo pants and I hung up, but I I I paused for a second. I was like, ah, okay, no, not yet, but but call me back in six months and I might, it might be cargo pants season. Okay. This is a Sometime very serious question though. Do you think yeah. if you started buying Porsche gear, wearing Porsche polos, like all the time, I do think that your pod influence big cat would be of such that all of a sudden you start showing up to like Wisconsin, Michigan state games and guys would be tailgating in Porsche gear. Yeah. I think that's a reality. Yeah. There's, there's definitely an element where I, I think I could, I don't think I'm an influencer, so to speak, but there are things I could push. I I, I do remember in like 2013, I want to say, I uh, essentially brought back bucket hats single handedly. I think we pushed like 2,000 bu bucket hats in the barstool store. Unreal. Stat. And they're they're just. I mean, I, I don't know when the last time you guys put on a good bucket hat, but Never. unless you're unless Been you're uh, yeah, unless you're a wide receiver at at training camp in the middle of August. The bucket hat, or like a two-year-old, the bucket hat is not a good look. But I had a good run for the summer. It was either 2013 or 14 where I was. I had some momentum behind the bucket hat trend. Hey, can I tell you something? One of the worst purchases I ever made, and that includes like multiple vehicles on eBay that don't work, etc. Uh, you know, even gambling investments, we'll call them. I I, I got a Gucci bucket hat when I got in the league. Black Gucci no bucket way. hat That's with so the good. green and oh red. My God. And I wore it 0.5 times. <laughs> you can't even count it. I tried to wear it on a Miami trip, like in the daytime. Like, hey, me and my buddies were drinking. We're going to like Wet Willies. We're having a good time. We're out, we're out on South Beach, right? This is the one place you can probably pull off Porsche gear. Easy. Miami, South Florida. But I tried the, the Gucci bucket hat. It was off my head by the time I... The first mirror I passed in the lobby. You know when you pass a mirror in the lobby... 
and you're like, oh, can't let people know that I just saw that I look like a total moron, but I got to go somewhere to change my look now. So you're you not afraid. Backpedal yeah. into a bathroom. <laughs> we got dressed for yeah. an event, and there were all sorts of just audibles. I mean, just like 383, 383. Me, yeah, me. just in and out, in and out. Oh, and yeah. then oh, we yeah. were like, okay. I'm a, I'm a changer. I change a lot. I don't he feel does. right. I got to feel good. Look good, feel good, play good, whatever they say. Okay, here's the question then. Because I was kind of flirting with like those Fox racing jackets which I know is going to look terrible on me because then there was one of Chris's boys. I think he played defensive back at UVA and we were all out one night and he looked like he came straight from motocross, like right out of a competition. There may have been really? shin pads. There were definitely racing pants and he had, yeah, yeah. Now you know who I'm talking about. Is that about. Mike? Is that yeah, Mike? Yeah, were yeah, we yeah. in New York? <laughs> yeah, we were in New York and he showed yeah, up and Mike. I was like, what's like, what are you like? I've got a CR 500. Like what's going on with you? And we're like, no, we're going out to a club. Like I was like, oh, no, he's a he's a he's a he's a punk. By that, I mean, he thinks that's like a a counterculture. It's called punk culture. I have no I I can't explain it to you. But he's like, no, dude, I'm a punk like I'm gothic. Oh, all right. Well, I thought he was super into dirt. But I got to tell you, like that jacket's kind of tight and it's got that extra plastic stuff. And so I thought, what if the three of us rocked racing outfits all weekend in New Orleans would there be a bump? If we have to stay married to it more than a weekend, it would have to be like three months of appearances only in racing outfits. But no, I, I would. I would is, do a. I'd do a racing outfit night with you guys. Yeah, and and you said this, Ryan, uh, to me last night. You're like, you know, guys. It seems like when they go out now, dress more alike than they ever have. Like every guy's wearing the same thing. So I honestly think the cargo pants, the bucket hat, maybe a kangle the early adopters are going to clean up because they're going to stick out. And that's confidence. Like if you can rock a bucket hat with confidence, people definitely look at you and like, what's that guy's deal? Like he's, he's got, he knows something we don't know because he looks like a fool, but he's wearing it with confidence. But the ironic thing is that Chris's confidence oozed out of him. Like Superman's powers around a piece of kryptonite. When you know he saw himself in the bucket hat, yeah, you like could, you just, I should, I should have looked in the mirror. Right. I mean, I did. The lobby mirror is too late, and then your whole day is going to be weird because you're going to be. Do I throw away this overpriced piece of shit, or do I like put it in my cargo pants pocket at the bar and store it there the rest of the day? I've, I've, yeah, I, I, I think I should have thrown it in the trash. I never wore it again. I held it because, because of what I paid for it, but it, it was awful. We were both, because Big Cat alerted me, like, I, we both looked at a birthday LA party, like a birthday party story on IG, and I looked at all the dudes, and I go, guys dress more alike now than ever before, and guys dress more alike than girls do. Like, I remember being in college, and there was just, there was just a thing that was handed to you as a girl, and you're like, you have to wear this. And then it turned into, like, the yoga pants and the massive size T-shirts. I went to, like, the fancy party with fancy people, and it was all girls in expensive high tops, leggings, and triple X Kanye T-shirts. And you're like, what is the point of this outfit? It looks terrible. But then I looked at dudes who were like, oh, <laughs> joggers, stock X sneakers, and some sort of hoodie and a dad hat. And I was like, you know what? I dressed like that on Friday in Atlanta and people thought I was from outer space, but that's just like, guys got to step it up. So your absolute point, big cat about whoever figures this out first, because the beards you've been questioning me, do I stay with the beard? I was very early in on the beard. Some say it you was do. some you sort of like with the beard. Yeah. I, I would say that, you know, I was accused of a supplemental thing there with the beard of like, trying to supplement something else. A 2010 national title game, like Palmer and McShay looked at me being like, you're still wearing the beard at the title game. And now I don't think, I think if you're an Equinox trainer and you apply for a job without a beard, they're like, dude, LA fitness is down the street. Like you can't work here <laughs> Bro, without if, a if, beard. If Jesse, pa Jesse Palmer can't talk about beards because Jesse Palmer the, you know, just, just, just Jesse Palmer looks like a movie star. You don't have to wear a beard. No offense to anybody with beards. And I have a beard. I feel protected. I feel like my flaws are kind of covered if I, up. I went handlebars late nineties, early two thousands. What if I bring that back now? Is Equinox going to be a handlebar friendly place in 2022? I don't know. I mean, this is just things it, I think. I about. don't, I don't know. You're going to look real globo, Jim. So I'm looking at trend spotter online right now for men's trends in 2020 cross body bags. Uh, Ooh, I mean, yeah, I can't wear yeah, those because I have breasts. My breasts are too big to wear those. <laughs> and by the way, pop, it's just, you know, like I've watched like guys when you put eat a seat with on and like people can like I always get self-conscious when I'm in an Uber and I put a seatbelt on <laughs> fashion. I put seat the seatbelt behind me because no. I know that people are looking at my breasts. <laughs> no, no, yeah. you do not in, yes, in real life. 
as a large I have never looked at man. your breasts. Hey, <laughs> Dan, I, 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 this, if this makes you feel better, because we all have insecurities, and it may, usually alleviates it when I tell you, I have never looked at your breasts if you didn't point them out. <laughs> Okay, right, so, and you've never seen me with. But a you're an ass guy anyway, Chris. It. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> what does Stephen A. call him? You're a swamp dweller. <laughs> Is that what he says? <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm I totally can't remember lost what is, here. So what much ass wrote, in the bro. middle of the day, sunshine. <laughs> oh, over the over the knee over the knee shorts uh, are coming back. Also, bell bottom looking ass jeans, which I will not be partaking in, are coming back. Okay, oversized right. blazers. Right, no, I, that's they, let me jump in here just to add more research because Chris is our research guy. I was going through like the black book thing of the fashion trends because I'm not afraid either, although I don't buy any clothes really anymore now since I moved to L.A. But the the new thing is all the baggy blazers again. So I'm like, yeah. that's it. Now it doesn't, it seems impossible to everybody listening right now that's buying suits or if you turn on any TV, but basically the magazines are telling you it's coming from France and it's going to be here in 12 months where you're going to be going bigger blazers. And we're going to look back at these tight Tebow Lululemon dress pants going, what the hell were you thinking? Just what bulge were we city. doing in yeah. 2019? Right. Bulge Bro, city. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. There's no way. There's no way. That I'm going to be able to pull my 2008 draft class suits out that I was like swimming in looking like a 1990s NBA player, like bold pinstripes, you know, Italian looking cuts, like not the new Italian looking cuts, like mobster looking cuts. I'm not going to be able to pull those back out in 2020. I don't believe it. Okay. So along that same line, is there a chance, maybe not next year, but in a couple years, we don't look back and we're like, I fear he really had it figured out. Like what he was wearing was really cool. Fire because shirts. Maybe, a lot of people. A lot of people are wondering. Shirts, maybe not the fire shirts, but I'm talking more like the bowling shirt, the Hawaiian shirt. I'm as a big guy. I think I've I've uh, I, Hawaiian shirts are kind of here. The Stranger Things cop kind of ruined it because he jacked my style. But I don't know when they taped it. When I started wearing Hawaiian shirts. Yeah, yeah. But listen. <laughs> Hawaiian yes. Harbor jacked your if, style. If, if, he did a little bit. I mean, he kind of did with the mustache and the Hawaiian shirt. But that is a classic misdirection move. If you're a bigger guy, if you're not, you know, Chris Long and Ryan Rosillo who go to the gym all the time and you're trying to hide those, the larger chest or maybe a, a, a soft tummy, throw on a Hawaiian, a bowling shirt, and it, it can really change the game because people don't really know I, what I to agree. look at. You got the designs going everywhere. People are kind of confused. It's like throw. It's like throwing an Ephus pitch out there, and people are like, "What is this guy?" And again, it's a confidence thing. Like if you are wearing a Hawaiian shirt in the middle of January, people are gonna be like, "That guy's confident," because we're sitting, we're in the middle of you know, like uh, New York City, or or you know, you're in Columbus, Ohio, wearing a a Hawaiian shirt, and it's January. That makes no sense. He must be confident. He's on to something, and we have three different issues here. I have no pecs, Ryan is all pecs, and Big Cat admittedly has boobs. So we all have different issues here, but we can all agree that like, if you're feeling a little self-conscious about, hey, maybe you're feeling a little bloated and soft after a day of drinking at a sports bar all day Sunday, and you got to go to the Orange Bowl. The, it Triple option offense of T-shirts yes. and shirts are the Hawaiian shirts. I mean, they, they can mask for so many talent deficiencies. Yes. I mean, like, bro. I love Hawaiian shirts. They never left. I stare at Tommy Bahama shit all the time at the mall. I'm just like, yes. Do I do I do it? I just need to just do it. I just need to load up and set the trend. That's yeah, because I'm saying it was that's deep, man. I mean, that stretch, guys, was intense. Anybody that spent any time in Vegas in the early 2000s, I mean, that was the Wonder Bra for men. When the Wonder Bra came out, you guys might be a little young for that. That really changed the game in the mid 90s. Like all the sword, like just silhouettes were different. And then guys were like, what the hell's going on here? And then women had to fall for the Tommy Bahama. Like, oh, this is the one that has cigars on it. This is the one that has a 57 Chevy on it. This is the one that has a bunch of palm <laughs> 57 trees. 57 Chevy one is the right. worst. Right. right. So yeah, like the, but the Route 66 it, one. It yeah, was untucked. Is... It was so baggy. So I just feel like that was such a deep stretch that I don't know if the turnaround can happen that quickly. It feels a little bit about like housing developments outside of Scottsdale. <laughs> it just that's what it feels like to me. And I'm not I'm afraid you'd be getting in still too early if you were doing that. I'm telling you, it's just I a think thought. I, 
I really do think in like five years, we're going to be like that guy, Fieri guy. Like he, yeah, his food was awesome, but really he figured out the fashion game before anyone else. Just a quick guy, Fieri, you know, in the celebrity beach bowl game, I lined up across from him and I went out to do a route. He's one of the fiercest competitors I've ever played in any sort of celebrity game. He immediately stuck his fingers right in my neck and I grabbed his hands and was mad. I got like instant rage, Ryan mad, where I'm like, what the fuck, man? And he just started dying laughing. And I, he was so what? funny. He was so funny about it that I actually immediately went from like raging mad to laughing on the inside because Guy Fieri scratched my neck with his fingernails. So you're, you're, Guy Fieri is your Lance Stevenson to your LeBron. Like just Ooh. Guy Fieri was on your ass, dude. And, I, and that makes me respect him even more that he I, was just oh, bringing it to your I, front. Dude. I don't know. It was really just a sort of a blip moment. I sort of forgot he was out there on the field, to be honest with you. This is a game developed, but no big deal. <laughs> Yeah, my guy Fieri, my guy Fieri story is uh, in Houston. The Super Bowl party that we had, which I think you guys were both there. Uh, I went up to Guy Fieri and I was like, "Hey, huge fan. Uh, you know, like this is our party. Like, you know, if you need anything, kind of thing." And he's like, "Cool. Can you get my son to meet Johnny Manziel?" And I was like, uh, "All right." And that, and I basically walked him over, and then they became fast friends. And I was like very quickly the odd man out where it's like this guy get him away from us because he's wearing a hawaiian shirt and cargo pants you're like an unconventional uh matchmaker for celebrities uh and by the way i wasn't yeah. at that party uh i didn't get an invite that was an awesome party that was an awesome party i'm sure it was great ryan knows that was an awesome party oh the houston one was good that was when uh ja rule took over the bathroom with his entourage and no one could use the bathroom <laughs> downstairs <laughs> we, oh, that we controlled was, I was, the whole yeah. party yeah we went we had we we controlled the whole party and it was uh we had like you know all the all the a-listers showed up and and had a good time and i think it cost way too much money and we're like we're never gonna do that again but it was good for one yeah all right so uh i think that's it like, I think, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just feel that's like this so pro the problem is the no here here's here's what the problem is i just held up four like for four minutes, because I got to get my ass to the Orange Bowl. My team's playing a New Year's Six game, but so oh, is you're yours. Get Big pasted. Cat, so. you're, yeah, you're gonna get pasted. By the way, Florida's gonna. Oh, is that put right? On you. Yep. Well, hit yep. my hit my direct line, Ben. Okay. Big boy. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm Wisconsin's gonna, gonna win on Wednesday. All right, well, I want to leave you guys with one thing. The last thing okay. I, I was thinking about with uh, uh, trends. I I the no show There's socks still are more. in. There's still more. Listen, the no show socks are in. The the long socks are in in like the lax bro culture. What about just the good old fashioned ankle socks? Ankle you know? sock, ankle sock. Yeah. My dad, no, no, my dad Howie Long. For those of you who don't know, my dad is Howie Long. He <laughs> he has been willing the ankle sock thing to happen for twenty five years. Okay. Sneakers, ankle white ankle socks. Yeah. Because they're like the forgotten sock. It, you when you see someone with the ankle socks, you're like, I think they probably tried to buy the no show socks and they just picked but up they the just wrong got pair stuck. at Target. Yeah, like they they just grabbed CBS. the bag. CBS. Yeah, see, right. So I feel like that's gonna be if we're talking summer trends, I think I'm gonna try to bring back the ankle sock where you're just showing some sock and it really makes no sense because you're kind of stuck in between. But again, it's a confidence thing where people are like, What's this guy's deal? His socks look terrible. My favorite part no, of the agree. podcast now is Big Cat being like, hold on before yeah. you have to go. Like, I know you have to leave in a couple minutes, but I have to get this sock in. I have out. another trend. Right. There's <laughs> one other thing that if I Listen, hang up without I got telling trends. you. Hey, that is Big I, Cat. I got trends. <laughs> I got trends. Happy New Year. And uh, we'll all see right. you in New Orleans. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. See you then. Yeah, maybe I'll see you in New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, I'm you'll be there. On it. You'll be there. All right. See ya. I was going to do a recap of LSU. That was as dominant as anything I've ever seen in person. Um, Oklahoma was not a terrible team as much as everybody wants to make it out to be. But this LSU defense that I kept telling you about that was misleading a little bit statistically, absolutely. I mean, look, it's one thing with Joe Burrow to have seven touchdowns like that. But we don't have enough time to do all that. So I think I'm going to save it for a little midweek because I had some North – shout out to Northside Tavern Friday night, rolled in with one of my boys. We kept it very low-key. I'd say a good 30 to 50 people showed up that were listening to the pod asking where Chris Long is. I took a video when the band was playing Peg, Steely Dan, all instrumental. That place is one of the top five bars in the United States. It's it's so good that Chris couldn't even watch the video. I did not open the video. I was just angry. I was filled with rage because I was anywhere but that bar. 
it's it's just great. And we had a story about a guy that cut us in line, but it looks like we're just going to have to save all this for later because I needed a ruling on this. A guy just looked at like seven of us that were in line, and the bathroom, unfortunately, is a single-service deal, although there's a side urinal in there where I have to think that, you know what, everybody just sees to kind of get collective, a little of that 60s mentality, commune, sharing, living, here's some rice, where yeah, you, no. you got you to set the tone to let the second guy in. But a guy sized us up and just went, I'm cutting all of you. And it was so dominant and it was so impressive that I, I everyone just let it happen instead of anybody getting mad. But um was home early that night and then didn't really go out at all on Saturday because I had an early flight on Sunday. And I wanted this pod. I wanted to get off to the week on a on a bright note. And that's, well, that's what we that, did Well, that bar will definitely uh, cheer you up. And this this was fun. And, and because I butchered the Happy Holidays thing last week, remember how bad I butchered the outro there? Yeah, yeah, that can was wish, weird. Can I wish everybody a happy New Year? Yeah, I think that's I think that's in the clear. I hope so. So happy New No, happy New Year, but I also want to wish the people uh you know celebrating the Chinese New Year, January 25th a happy New Year as well. It's not just New Year's here, it's there's Year other the years what? elsewhere. Uh it's probably the dragon. Oh. Well, let me look that up real quick before we roll. Uh that is the year of uh mongoose. Is it? That's what I have. Double check be, that, though. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a tough year. Mongooses are very tough animals. What do you have? Did you look it up? Uh, no, I, I I trust you. Okay, so it is the... Uh, yeah, don't trust oh, me. It's the that. rat. Oh, it's the rat. Oh, not a great year. You're the rat. Do we know that, though? Yeah, we know that. My friend Chris here. No, no, uh, I mean that, but like, you're the rat. I think on the surface, like, what does that mean? Um, oh, it says 2020, what to wear, year of the rat. You know what? I think we covered enough enough of the fashion stuff on today's pod, so we're just going to table yeah, that it one. It probably aligns time. perfectly with the Chinese New Year lookbook for 2020. Done and done. Okay. At Joel91, Chalk Media, check it out. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed this one. That's the regular season. I, we were keeping it rolling through the playoffs. I have a hard time believing that we're just ending this. Um, yeah, we'll if you guys uh, respond to a bunch of our tweets, uh, under our tweets, we'll keep podcasting. Done. All right. Yes, please subscribe, rate, and review the Ryan Rosillo podcast and check out all of our content on The Ringer. I will talk to you Wednesday. Uh, we'll have pods coming out this week, even with the holiday, and then we'll be back to our normal schedule the following week. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs>